sorry about that. I didn't mean to misrepresent you, but thank you for making that point. I think we need to understand that fragmentation is one of the key ways by which you keep people down. It has the, the, the propaganda against us before, during, and after the war is that this is an evil thing, whatever that means. This is um, definitely the prime victims, the prime target of the war, as well as the killings before the war were the evil people. But you had many, many, many others a significant part of this narrative and we must try to restore that connection that we had if we were to move forward. The creation of states before the war was not done out of love for us, it was done to divide us and it has been successful to a large extent. But we can't continue to allow ourselves to be victims of that propaganda. Those of us who are familiar with a number of historical and cultural facts know that for centuries we lived in harmony in that part of Nigeria that we call the eastern region or the Niger Delta. That's why you have Apo society in various Igbo communities, as well as in my community, among the Ibibios, among the Efics, the Ejagam people, the Anang people, the Oron people. That's not my phone, just so you know. Anyway, you also have the Ekbe society. A lot of our languages define similarities. There are Igbo people who say Obasi, we say Abasi. So we cannot allow ourselves to constantly be fragmented. My people have been told, and they were told when we were given Southeastern State, that we are giving you autonomy to protect you against those evil people. That is the create. That's the. That's the purpose of the creation of states. Otherwise, what value has it added to our lives since we got those states? No. Nothing. I'm from a so-called oil-producing state, but there's nothing in my life that shows that I've benefited from a drop of that oil. So let's be very careful about allowing ourselves to buy into that propaganda and ultimately to continue to make enemies of ourselves, whereas we've worked together and lived together in harmony with very fluid boundaries for centuries. And on this note, I would like to refer respectfully to your presentation, Law Lomunde, because you do make a number of important facts about historical figures coming out of Igbo land, but Perhaps we can talk a little bit more about the fact that they were significant by way of their connection with many other communities outside of Igbo land. In fact, that it was their greatness. The man who you refer to as uh, King Jaja of Opobo, where did he come from originally? I went to school, secondary school, with members of his family, and they all spoke impeccable Igbo. But they also spoke Ibibio. They also spoke Anan. You see, so we need to make those connections. And again, I respect your reference to the Igbo women's war, but even that narrative, we have to broaden that narrative. That revolution may have started in 1929, somewhere around Abba, but ultimately from what end of what we understand to be the eastern region to the other end, women were involved. From Bialta State, River State, Akwaibom, Cross River, my own grandmother participated in that revolution. And she was an Ibibio woman. 
So let's be very careful. We do have monuments built to women in Ikarabasi who participated in that revolution. Let's not isolate ourselves. It is a strategy, but we can't allow it to work. Now, I want to also refer to the demonization of General Ujuku. And again, you said it, sir, that he didn't force us into war. I wasn't as old as you, but I lived in Enugu. We had run from Nigeria and Kaduna, and we were, we were now in Enugu at the onset of the war. Though I was a boy, I still have vivid memories. I remember when the shells started to land in Enugu, and I remember when people were marching along the streets and singing, we are beer, friends. I'm not going to sing too much because I don't have the voice that you are, <laughs> that you no care have. Fighting for survival. In the name of Jesus, we shall conquer. And people were marching and they were determined why, apart from what you said, remember that a lot of these people had lost their parents, their brothers, their sisters, their friends, not just in northern Nigeria, but in other parts of Nigeria, including the West, and they had come home. And here these people had the nerve to follow them right down to their communities and say, we're going to keep on killing you. What do people do in a situation like that? And you say, Ujuku was the one. Even a rat, if you pursue a rat and corner it here, it's going to turn back and fight you. The other option is to just sit down there and die like you are nothing. So, let's be very careful. You see, when, when people who hate you want to say things against you, they'll manage to sound intellectual. So when they talk about Ojuku, you look for the worst you can. They've even told me how my father and Ojuku were in disagreement. I have disagreed with my own father. Does it make him my enemy? No. Disagreement is, is, is all over the place. In, your, in our churches, there's disagreement, isn't there? In our families, in our communities. If people did not disagree in Biafra, it would be unusual. These were desperate times and there, were no, there, was no, there was no solution, easy solution to the problem. So people had to disagree. But let's look at some other facts about General Ojuku. Don't forget that he had done, he had been very diplomatic for a long time. Going, you know about the Aburi talks? One thing people don't even talk about when they talk about the Aburi talks is that he agreed to submit to General Gowan's authority. But that wasn't good enough. Now, apart from the fact that they came back and they reneged on sections of the agreement, then they created states. And I, hear, I don't hear people talking a lot about that. What did the creation of states do to General Ojuku? It marginalized him. It declared him a non-entity. But who was the person up until that point that dared to speak for what had happened to Easterners? Was there anybody else? So when you sideline him, that is, it was it was spiteful on all people of the of the Eastern region. And then you created the East Central State. Did they consult with you or myself? And who was the new leader that they instituted? Was it a leader that had spoken for you? No. So we need, to, we, need to, we need to be aware of some of these facts. Let's also remember that as our people were being killed in different parts of the country, people responded naturally like people should respond. And there were some efforts at retaliation. Even the home of the mayor of Enugu, of Enugu who was a house of Mahmoud yeah, yeah. down. However, what people need to also acknowledge is that Ojuku stepped in, stopped the violence, and provided safe passage for a lot of those non ebos out of Enugu and other parts of the world. <laughs> so,
So it is good to provide a balanced picture. If we're looking for perfection, we won't find it anywhere, certainly not amongst anyone that's human. But like I said, people who hate you will want to say negative things about you and your leaders and sound intellectual in the process. This is why we need to arm ourselves with the truth. Another thing I'd like to say as we move forward is let us consider a significant part of this narrative and that's post-war, post-war Biafra. You see, the war lasted two and a half years, but for many of us, it's continuing to this day. I don't know what that 20 pounds did for you if you got it. You know the 20 pounds I'm talking about? Yes. Did nothing for my life. Okay, and my father was a professional soldier. He wasn't a doctor or an engineer in the army. He wasn't a teacher. So when you took his livelihood from him, just like it was done to millions of others, that was part of the continuation of the destruction of our lives. It was supposed to break us and it infuriates them that we refuse to be broken. Mm. So you still hear them say, ah, these evil people like money too much. You know, that's jealousy. When they outdo you in business, because you, were, you thought you had destroyed them. But they would rise up and reinvent themselves. And when you say anything Biafra, they hate you because they were supposed to wipe you and the thought of Biafra off the face of the earth. So how dare you talk about Biafra? We meant to exterminate you, but we, we didn't succeed in doing it. That is their pain. Their pain is not that you're trying to create a new nation. That's not their pain. They've never lived as one with us. So why pretend as if anybody who wants to go away is, is, is doing some damage to your life? What they are afraid of is the fact that they won't have the kind of control that they have. You see, now there's control without necessarily occupying your land. So they can put a, a, a refinery up in Kaduna and take the resource from your land. They don't have to exist on your land and take your land. But if they're deprived of that kind of control, they'll be in trouble. At least that's what they think. So that's their problem with you. They hate the fact that we survive. And... We will continue to survive because we are not. People have told me, hey, you can use your father's name and get contracts. You can become very rich in Nigeria. And I say, first of all, it's not likely. One of the disadvantages I've had is I'm not just F. Young and Philip. But I don't need their contracts. Yes. I don't need political appointments. Yes. How did we survive all these years? Is it with their contracts? No. Did they, were they the ones that sent us back to school and trained us? No. What is it? I don't need them. So they can take whatever it is they think they have and stick it up wherever they want to. <laughs> now I would like to... Yeah, I was talking about post-war Biafra. So let, let that be a subject we look at more closely. And in the process, let's look at ourselves and let's think about some of the things that are not necessarily flattering, like what has happened to our veterans in Oji River. 
don't know how many of you are aware, but I'm not sure that we've treated them right. But that is a, a, a subject for another time, and that would be part of the post-war narrative. Two major, two more points, and I'll be done. One, I want to refer to Professor Noke sitting here, and Mazi Onyeji sitting there. And is there anybody else who fought in the war that's here? Do you mind just sharing, please? Okay, what are you here? Yes, sir. Now, so far, these men and the women have been humble. But I think we need to come to terms with what they did, what they did for us. We must remember that they were going up against forces in difficult and impossible situations and how they managed to keep that country in existence for almost three years is beyond imagination. The recapture of Oweri should be published as a major accomplishment in the history of human warfare. were out in the bushes for days and nights. They didn't necessarily eat well as the war progressed. Our resources became less and less. Sometimes they were there in their bare feet. There was a time towards the end of the war, even uniforms were a problem. They would just sew the Biafra sun onto someone's shirt. But they went in there with their determination and their love. And they fought diligently, and we owe them much. We can't thank them enough. Yeah. And don't forget what they were going up against. It was not just a larger Nigerian army, a better equipped, better trained. They were also going up against. How many of you live in London? Okay, I don't need to say much about some of your enemies, you know, some of the support they got from Russia, Egypt. So we, we owe them a debt of gratitude. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And finally, one more thing, if you don't mind my saying it. If you notice when I sat down here, I was given this. Put it on and I took it off. Listen to me. Spiritually and by way of principle, I usually don't use images. I'm a Christian, you won't see me hang a cross. On my car, you won't see my declaration of the things I support. But then I looked at it again and said, Biafra is my home. Which other home have I ever had? After my father was denied the right to contest election in 1978, I knew then, even as young as I was, that I didn't have a place in Nigeria. And Nigeria had a special hatred for my father and my family. It doesn't matter what anybody tells me, I know I cannot aspire to my ultimate goals. I can't have a vision in Nigeria, not because I haven't tried, but because there's so much exclusion that anybody can tolerate. I have never rigged an election in Nigeria. I haven't stolen a penny of government money. I've served well. In every job I've done, I've never been fired. But I do understand because Nigeria has constantly told me, either you or your family belong here. And so, I need another country. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
proud. Thank you so much. But let me just say, like I said, I'm not a person of physical symbols. It's not that I don't use them. Even the university where I teach, you hardly see me with a t-shirt or maybe during the basketball game I may wear. But here's my point. We don't want to be, I believe we have Christians here, and even if you're not a Christian, we don't want to be like what Christ referred to. He talked about people who act religious, but they are like filthy tombstones. The tombstones are shiny and nice on the outside, but when you open them up, you see rotten skeleton that's right. In other words, I want to go by the principle of the Bible that says by their fruits. Murder. You see, I can wear a crucifix and still be a murderer. And still be a rapist. And still be a thief. And so what I would advise is that even as we have the symbols, we should aspire for something else that's bigger than the symbols, and that's the fruit. In other words, the spirit of Biafra. You see, before you can attain anything physical, in your mind, you must have it. What is the spirit of Biafra you can help me? It was one of diligence, efficiency. Those of you who fought during the war, you know that without the kind of technology we have, no cell phone, nothing, but somehow people were able to communicate. The administrative systems were very effective. Look at the announcements. That, uh, the, the, the announcement my father made on the 12th, that radio station should really not have existed. How did they build that? Okay. So it was a spirit of creativity. Look at uh, crude oil. Crude oil was harvested from lands that are not even considered traditional oil producing lands. It was a spirit of self-sacrifice, of camaraderie and unity. Everybody did everything, not for themselves, but for other people. And so, you have the Biafran spirit. When you have the Biafran spirit, everything else will fall in place. It was a spirit of determination. Self-sacrifice. When you went to the war front, did you go planning I will come out alive? No. You said, but if I have to do this to protect my brothers and sisters, I will do it. So let us try and restore and ensure that we have that spirit. I live by that spirit. And we need that spirit if we're going to protect ourselves against the